welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. And uh, I know that it's Friday, and I was just driving down to the beach. But, uh, yeah. Great to be, uh, great weather to be at the beach today. So thanks for uh, sacrificing your beach day to come here. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, my associate, Dr. Stephanie Young, who will uh, be co-presenting this with me today. And uh, she'll be coming on in a, in a moment. Uh, but let's, uh, let me get started. I'll uh, go through some of my slides. But really, at the end of the day, it's, it's an interactive session. I, I like to you know, have people freely ask questions, uh, because that's really, I'm here for you. And uh, so, um, so today, no, I, I was here about a year ago actually. Uh, so it was, it was a, just a wonderful interaction with, with some of you who, who, was, who were there. And um, so today's topic, you know, we thought about what you can do to improve your quality of life. I mean, after all, you know, you're here because either yourself or your family member or someone that you care or love going through cancer. And uh, so it's not, a, it's not an easy situation that either you or your loved one's facing. Um, you know, it's, it's amazing, but I don't know anyone whose lives have not been touched by cancer. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's so prevalent. And, and that's the scary part, it's so prevalent. Both of my in-laws uh, passed away from cancer. Uh, my mother-in-law had lung cancer at age 63, and uh, she had the non-small cell carcinoma. She never smoked. And um, so, um, so non-small cell carcinoma is not related to smoking. And, uh, and she, um, it was discovered too late. And then 10 years later, my father-in-law, bless his heart, uh, was diagnosed with liver cancer. And uh, he had hepatitis B, hepatitis C, um, and uh, that led to cirrhosis, and then it, it caused um, uh, liver cancer. And so with a combination of the various therapies, um, you know, for, for him, liver cancer, that there was really not a whole lot to do. So we did something a little bit, little bit of outside the box. You know, we did uh, ethanol injection. It was kind of ironic because, um, you know, alcohol causes cirrhosis and liver cancer eventually, and, um, and we're using alcohol to knock out his tumor. So it was an ultra, uh, ultrasound-guided alcohol injection. And along with lifestyle changes, he, he found new religion, meaning he went on a, you know, he went to a plant-based diet. He started exercising uh, every day. And, uh, and he did all the things that he never did. Um, and he lived six years. And he was uh, in good health all the way to the end. Um, so, you know, lifestyle is important, and, and what I want to focus on isn't so much the cure, because you've got great professionals who are, you know, taking care of the condition, right, the disease. Uh, but what about you in your life? What can you do to help you feel better? You know, cancer doesn't have to mean the, you know, the end of the quality of your life, even though it's tough at times. If you're undergoing chemo, we work with so many cancer patients. Um, that's a majority, it's a, it's a good part of our practice. We have nine doctors, and we see many cancer patients undergoing chemo, radiation, surgery. Um, and our job is to support our patients while going through these therapies and to improve quality of life. And so really that's what we're gonna talk about today, um, is what you can do to have more energy, better brain function. Is that, is that useful? Maybe the, you know, a little chemo brain sets in after a while. And uh, so, that, so that could be useful, you know. So, um, and what about the topic of libido? 
and, and, and sex. I mean, that's almost like a tabooed area because you just don't get into it anymore. Um, but in fact, we've helped many of our patients restore their sex life. And that's important because, uh, you know, when you are intimate with your loved one and you um, experience all those wonderful endorphins and, and neurochemicals, and I mean, that's very positive, not just for your mood, but also for your, for your physical health. And uh, so, a number of things. I chose to focus on um, spices, literally, you know. I, I mean, the title of this topic is Spice Up Your Life, right? So, I literally am going to talk about that. Um, this year, I came out with another book, I know. Um, I used to, I used to, uh, I used to tell my father, you know, he's, he's like, he's written 50 books in Chinese and over 80 books in English now. And I said, Dad, another book? <laughs> yes, another book, yes. So I, I've, I've kind of become like him, I, you know, another book. But this was a fun book. This is, see, this is a Secret to Longevity cookbook. It's a, it's a follow-up book to my very lucky bestseller, Secret to Longevity, which is now in 22 languages. And uh, so as I travel the world, interview centenarians, I also... Um, I guess I was smart enough to ask them for their favorite recipe. <laughs> so, so over 25 years, I've accumulated quite a few recipes, and I went through all these recipes and, uh, and put them into this book. And it's been a lot of fun. Uh, this, this, uh, this book kind of makes it come alive, because Dr. Stefan and I will sit down with our patients and we'll say, OK, eat this list of food and avoid this list of foods. And, then they look at us like, okay, are you going to cook for me? Because what do I do with these strange sounding foods, right? And so I finally decided, okay, enough. We're going to put it into an action, you know, book here. So it's got recipe, it's got stories, it's got um, a lot. Oh, pictures, yeah, pictures, yes. Although. You know, the, the publisher was uh, very El Cheapo. They only gave me 25 pictures to play with. And so, anyway, so there's 25. But they're beautiful pictures, I have to say. I, I um, asked a friend of mine who's a kind of a fashion photographer for Vogue, you know. And uh, he's never shot food before. So I said, can you, can you make food look as beautiful as women? And he says, absolutely. So that's, that's one of the pictures. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? And this book is filled with these beautiful pictures that, um, uh, you know, again, you know, food and, food and women. Not, not in a bad way. Food. You know, beautiful, right? Beautiful images. I know. You're, don't get the wrong idea here. So, um, you have a lot of people come and talk to you about all kinds of topics and so forth. And, and um, so I, I promised that I wasn't going to address the immune system too much because you've been immune systemed out with all the different lectures. Uh, so what I thought is, okay, there are lots of things that you can do uh, simply just in your spice rack, you know, uh, or the little herbs that you're growing on your kitchen counter there. And they pack a punch. I mean, these little things are incredible. And in fact, all the, all the things that I'm going to talk about as examples, okay, today, are, um, possess a property called anti-angiogenesis. I don't know if you're familiar with that concept. How many people have heard of angiogenesis? Okay, so, all right. So, angiogenesis is essentially the growth of little blood vessels that tumors and cancer causes in order to feed itself, right? Because any cancer can't survive without supply of nutrients and oxygen. So a tumor cell or tumor is no different than your muscles. Your muscles need blood flow, oxygen, nutrients to get stronger. Well, tumor cells the same thing. So the tumor cells will release 
a factor that encourages the growth of this vascular endothelium. So it grows these little capillaries in order to get all the supply to it. So that's angiogenesis. Anti -an angiogenesis is the opposite, which is to block the formation of these you know, little capillary flow that feeds the cancer. <coughs> This whole field of anti-angiogenesis is probably going to revolutionize the treatment of cancer. All right. There's currently over 100 drugs under study and trial right now that have some form of anti-angiogenesis properties. Okay. Avastin is the like, you know, the first example of this category of drugs, right? You've heard maybe some of you have even been on it, the vast and so forth. But the you know the next generation of anti-angiogenesis are going to be even more potent. Okay. Uh, so what's unique though about this is that actually anti-angiogenesis can be accomplished with what you eat. You can add certain foods into your diet that is going to block the formation of harmful blood vessels that feeds your tumor. And uh, so kind of an exciting area that isn't being talked a lot about yet because the truck companies are jockeying to patent all these things. And so right now there isn't, but, but probably in about a year or two, it's gonna, there's gonna be an explosion of, uh, uh, on, on the scene. So let's talk about a few things. But before we get there, let me just kind of give you a little background for some of you who are new. Um, my little background, you know, I, it's, it's hard to, you know, for me to stand up here and talk to you. Um, you know, I, I have to admit, you know, last time when I was here, a year ago, I gave a lecture and a talk that was pretty uppity. And, uh, and I think 99% of the people were really kind of, you know, sort of happily, impacted and and I had um, one person that contacted me afterwards and um, and told me that she was offended by my um, uppity talk and uh, and the reason was she she, she said um, you know you can never know what it feels like to have stage four cancer and she humbled me I, I I had nothing to say. I said, you're absolutely right. You know, it, it is a difficult, an unimaginable process that you guys go through. And so I'm happy to share my little experience and so that maybe it's a different context, um, but you know, the struggles that I think as humans that we go through and what we sort of need to do to help ourselves, you know. And so, when I was six years old, I fell from the three-story uh, rooftop of our house, and I was in a coma for about a month. And when I woke up, I was paralyzed. And so, you know, it was, it's been a process for me. And it's difficult because when I relate this story, you know, I, I think about I think about some of my patients who um, who didn't make it, you know. And uh, so, but anyway, it was through a lot of um, treatment, you know, acupuncture, herbal therapy, because I, I was lucky to be born into this family. So, you know, my my father was uh, one of the best doctors there was, and he took care of me. Uh, the love of my mom and everybody around me really just kind of rallied to my cause and uh, they never gave up on me. And so, and, and I was able to restore my health and my ability to walk and, um, and I participated even in martial arts and uh, won a few medals along the way. And so, and really, you know, when you try to recover from a devastating illness, um, you really need the community. You need your family, you need your friends, you need your neighbors, and you need 
places like this right here, you know, the Benjamin Zen. You guys are doing great work here. Oh, I, I like that. It's, that's uh, very, no, that's very cheerful. Um, <laughs> anyway, so um, so I, I want to just you know put it out there that you know if you're a family um, a member that's supporting your loved one going through the disease, thank you. And uh, and if you're here fighting the disease, uh, just know that you've got this incredible support network right here. Everyone's here for you. So anyway, part of our um, training and, and work is, is using mind-body practice like Qigong, uh, Tai Chi, and there are classes here as well. And so I encourage you, you know, these are self-regulation type of practices, you know, getting your body to respond. And, and my family tradition, here's my grandpa. Uh, he was, a, you know, um, his father, my grand-grandfather was a pediatrician who perished during a, an epidemic while helping in the village. And uh, so anyway, he restored our family tradition despite the demise of his own father. And then, and then my father, who I started with, and I'm, I'm uh, very grateful for the wisdom that he has um, passed on to me, and I'm going to go visit him on Saturday in China, and he's, he's doing quite well, thank goodness, you know. And uh, we found a university called Yosan University in, uh, in the name of our grandfather to continue his legacy so that we can train more healers to go out and, you know, help more people. And our office style wellness um, has, uh, we, have, we have three offices now in Santa Monica, Newport Beach, and Pasadena. Um, Stephanie's from our Santa Monica office. Um, we have nine doctors. We deliver uh, about 30,000 treatments a year. Um, and some of you who uh, have had acupuncture can appreciate that there are a number of, you know, sort of uh, properties that acupuncture. Acupuncture stimulates your own self-healing. And same thing as if you, you know, use diet, use yoga, use qigong, other ways to activate your body. Your body is ultimately quite amazing and intelligent. And so what we need to do is learn how to work with it and learn how to activate it. And, um, and energy therapy, you know, we're talking about uh, various, you know, access to different things. Like so many people are so afraid of light, you know, like sunlight. And I say, get out and get some sun. My good, by, by all means, 20 minutes a day is not going to harm you and give you skin cancer. And it might uh, help you with some vitamin D production, which is true that all cancer patients have lower than normal vitamin D level. So you just need to get your vitamin D level back up. You know, so, um, you know, the, so the different, so using heat, you know, we're, uh, we have this therapy called MOXA, you know, therapy, heat therapy, but in, in more recent years, we've uh, found that far infrared has very similar properties, and so we're starting to use far infrared to help as well, electrostimulation, sound therapy, for example. So, what can you do to spice up your life, literally, okay? And, um, and we have handouts for you, let's see, we have, uh, so you have a handout here from my book, Okay, so this is a handout. Now you don't have to buy the book anymore, right? Because this is really the crux of the uh, the book right here. In this two-page, and we try to save paper, so um, front and back. Um, there's ten spice blends here, and the spice blends, okay, include spice blends for heart health, immunity, anti-inflammatory, metabolism, cleansing. Digestion, brain and vision, skin, beauty, uh, good mood, and last but not the least, sexual health. All right. So you see, so there's a list. You can go home and make your own spice blend, or you can try. You know, we brought these spice blends for you. Uh, Jenny, my assistant, came. Uh, she's back there, and she put out those jars of spice blends there. It's and delicious. Oh, did you try it already? Yeah. yeah. You know, it's interesting. Whenever we have these spice blend tasting, guess which one goes the, the quickest? 
how did you know the sexual health one just disappeared? Um, yeah, I, I actually saw a guy go like this in his pocket. Uh, so um, <laughs> that's not where it goes. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right. Yes, yes. Um, so, so I've got so so we're going to do a few things today. Oh, the, the sexual health one. Oh, yeah. Oh, the sexual health one. Yes. Yeah, that's that's the most popular. Yeah, that's. The, yeah, that's. Well, no, it's a blend. So I'm going to talk about that. It's like yes. <laughs> you want it now? Okay. Well, hold your orders because it. it I, I leave the best for last here. So please, let's let's not hurry you. All right. So, uh, but but believe it or not, you know everything I have up here. Every one of these possess anti-angiogenesis properties. So it's not just spices, but if you look at artichokes, beets, bok choy, broccoli, you know, we all know the brassica type of uh, vegetables, the, the cauliflower um, and the, uh, the, the Brussels sprouts. So we've got cabbage, got carrot, ca uh, char, collards, endive, fennel, garlic. I mean, there's, there's all these wonderful foods you can see here, right? Uh, and this is one of the reasons why, you know, like red meat doesn't have anti-angiogenesis property. I mean, it's just not on here. So it's not to say you shouldn't eat it, but eat more of this, right? That's what you want to do. You want to make sure you're eating as many things that help you, okay? Uh, but our topic today is really about spicing up your life. So here are some of the examples of spices that you can use. So let's get right into it, right? So cayenne, okay. So um, I'm going to do a, a, a little giveaway, right? So of the of the ten properties I just talked about, right? Everything from the heart to the sex and everything in between. Um, hmm, heart and sex, that kind of rhymes. Um, which one do you think cayenne is it? Well, well, obviously it's in a lot of them, but the number one heart. 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 Oh, who said heart? Oh, uh, well, she wins a book. So don't worry, you have you have a you have a chance. Yes. Okay. Good. All right. All right. Good. So. Uh, so, well, cayenne, of course, yes, you're absolutely right. You know, the, these uh, chili peppers are fabulous for all kinds of things, uh, not the least. Okay, circulation, right, circulation. It's wonderful. I mean, all the studies show that cayenne can actually dilate the blood vessels, increase blood vessels. Now, the circulation, this is good circulation. This is going to the right places. <coughs> You know, the brain, that's why it's also good for the brain. It's, you know, and, and sexually, of course, um, you know, I'm sorry, did I point in the wrong direction? Yeah, <laughs> to the right places, yes. I don't really like spicy, so how much yeah, of that do I have to eat? Can I eat yeah, a little bit of that? But of course, just a, just a little bit. You ever watch these cooking shows? You know, my son used to love Emerald when he went bam, 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 and he just throws it all on, right? You don't have to do bam, bam. You can just, like, sprinkle, like, little sprinkle, and that's it, just a little. And if you did it every day, now, by the way, you know, some people say, well, gee, I'm stuck, I have upset stomach, you know, I have um, uh, acid reflux or GERD. Well, it's a little bit, it's okay. In fact, it helps, because cayenne also inhibits bacterial, uh, you know, some things like H. pylori and, and other bacteria, so it's just a good thing. Oh, oh, yes. Is it available and as effective as pill form? Uh, is it, yes, it's available and effective in a capsule form. So that's available too. So if you, for example, you don't like spicy food, well, you can take it in a capsule as well. But I sort of like people to use it. I mean, eat it, right? No, I mean, I know it's in a lot of foods. You don't necessarily taste it, but I'm just curious. Exactly. Right. Yes. Sir. Do you use powder I make a or the with, with, with okay. butter? I pour that uh, the cayon on the butter and I mix it with scrambled egg, organic eggs and stuff like that. Think of that, and I put some, uh, add a little oregano, <coughs> spices it up. I, I like that. You know, butter, 
organic egg and cayenne and I you know what the cayenne is protecting your heart from all that butter <laughs> it's amazing I mean he came up with a really nice combo you know you know so so one of the things you have to realize is that there are these cultural nuances that I put in to the cookbook because I interview centenarians around the world so that means there are these ethnic recipes and would you believe right uh, we all know the fact that if you eat a lot of red meat, right, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to increase your risk for uh, colon cancer, right? Mm -hmm. So then you look at the Germans, and they eat all this sausage, this red meat, and yet their, their colon cancer rate is a lot lower than ours. And why? They pair it, well, hormones, yes, one. They pair it with what? Sauerkraut. Sauerkraut, which is cabbage, which is fermented, which mm -hmm. increases your probiotics, right, the lacto, uh, lactobacillus and other kind of friendly bacteria, which, by the way, has been shown, the research, very new research just came out, that probiotics, like lactobacillus, lowers the risk for colon cancer. That's fresh off the press, uh, the research. So, you see the food pairing, right? So this gentleman here, He's eating all these eggs every day, and he, you know, he's still okay. His heart is not, you know, because of that cayenne he's using. Well, I don't use but, it every day. But. I, I, I'm teasing. I'm teasing, yes. Yes. I eat my garlic. Fresh herbs, fresh peppers, rather than dry. I prefer that I use all the time. And what's Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay, so excellent question. So, you know, all the spices and herbs, they possess something called volatile oils. That's what gives them the kick, right? And so, by all means, fresh is always the best. But, of course, if you don't have access to fresh, then use the dry one. Because when they dry it, you know, they, they still keep some of the volatile oils. And that's why it still, it still has that spice, but maybe not as much. So, powder. absolutely. I'm sorry? Powder. Powder, yes. It's good? Yes. Well, for me, uh, it, you know, ideally speaking, um, if you can get it fresh, great. If not, then, you know, use the powder version. And, uh, but, but, you know, by all means, experiment, right? Mm -hmm. They all uh, have wonderful properties. Uh, let's go to the next one. So he talked about oregano. Yes, so you have a question. question. Yes. Um, I've, I've had these tablets for a couple of years now. I believe it's cayenne pepper and either echinacea or golden seal. And I, was, I thought that they, one of those spices was good for the immune system. Absolutely. Okay. Golden seal, echinacea are good for the immune system, and so is cayenne. I mean, cayenne has these wonderful properties. Of course, when I talk about each of these things, right, it isn't so much that they're exclusively only for one. You'll see, you know, that they have multiple properties. So, but I'm I'm just highlighting it because, you know, I mean, just remember, red, heart, red. You know, it's easy to remember, right? So oregano. All right, so oregano. So, uh, so you put oregano on your on your eggs. There you go. So, that's great. So, the oil oregano on my tongue. Exactly. So, what is oregano known for? What are the major properties of oregano? Right, right back there. Antifungal. Antifungal. Antibacterial. It's got antimicrobial properties. So, in other words, it kills germs, and it's good for your immune system. So, right there, you know, it kind of leads the pack and kind of immune. Herb. Now, there are many other herbs and spices that are good for the immune system, but again, I'm just highlighting about 10 that are really fantastic, you know, and known for their properties. And uh, of course, this everybody knows because there's so much research on turmeric, right? Uh, and, uh, and what is turmeric known for? Anti-inflammatory. It's also anti-cancerous as well. And what's really unique about this, all right, is that it's, um, there's a blood thinner called coumadin that was extracted from turmeric originally. So it's a blood thinner. And yet it has anti-angiogenesis property. It blocks the formation of harmful blood vessels that feed the tumor. And so turmeric. And if you like curry, right, that's what gives curry that yellow color, right? Yes. Curcumin. Well, yeah, that's an extract of turmeric. Yeah, the curcumin is the, you know, active ingredient of turmeric. I do eat a lot of turmeric, but I also take 
the baby aspirin, is that too much? Is that well, uh, you could do too much, yes. So, so what it is, well the baby aspirin is not bad. If you are on Plavix or Coumadin or Wayfarin and things like that, you, you need to let your doctor know that you're eating a lot of turmeric, right? Uh, so they may, you know, sort of check your blood more closely to make sure that you're, you know, you're not taking too much. Generally speaking, it's not an issue, but, yeah. Let me ask you, I talked to an integrated oncologist once who talked about spices and how you, you know, you can take them with food, but you can't take them with other foods. Is that Yeah, more spices. absolutely. Uh, as local as you can, we obviously don't produce turmeric in in most parts of the U.S. It comes from Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. But can you grow this on your kitchen sure. counter? Uh, can you grow this too? Absolutely. You know, many of these things we can grow. All right. So I would just grow it right outside of your 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 house, or you know, like I said, I mean, just just do what you can. Fresh, the better. Uh, organic, of course, the better if you can. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the the sources where they come from, you obviously don't want to get the ones. Your cook was right. Does it kill all the bugs? No, no. The, the spices. Here's the thing, right? Spices are very potent, and they have protective. They are all full of antioxidants as well. So they they kind of protect themselves from being destroyed. In fact, these colors, right? I mean, this is amazing, right? That color right there, the the. So there's these pigment on the plant are where the antioxidants are and they prevent destruction from UV light. You know how strong the UV light is, right? You ever try to go outside without, like go to the beach for one day without any sunblock, what happens to you? Well, you're like fry like a lobster, right? Like, like this, yeah. However, do you see any plants get burned by the sun? I mean, they're under the sun all the time but so studies find I mean, it's, you know so all the studies show that it's the pigment that protects the plant from the UV damage and that same pigment can help us in our health so that's the exciting part of this whole thing right so that yellow pigment right there fabulous a lot of crop noise cinnamon yes indeed cinnamon so all right so here's uh Here's the tricky question. I, I, I have to give away some of these things, so, uh, yeah. So, uh, oh yeah, let, let's do this one. You know, my best-selling book in Yiddish. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, it's not in Yiddish, it's in English. Yeah. Uh, so, um, all right. So, of all the 10 properties that I named, okay, remember what I said, right? Okay, you, you memorize that because you've been Setting up on. Uh, uh, oh, okay, okay, I'm gonna name again, okay? Yeah, I'm gonna name again. So I'm gonna scramble it for you guys. Uh, skin, beauty, brain and vision, digestion, sexual health, good mood, um, immunity, metabolism, anti-inflammatory, heart and cleansing. So which one? Metabolism. Metabolism. Wow. Yes. All right. You you win the prize. Metabolism. Yeah. So so yes. So cinnamon, right? It, it controls the blood sugar. It prevents it from spiking. And so it's fantastic for. Um, so if you uh, you know this. This is, this is what I tell my patients. It's, it's really not a good advice, so I don't want you to follow it. I said, I know. You can't help yourself, and you must eat that scoop of ice cream late at night. And I said, okay, if you must do it, please make a cinnamon tea and throw cinnamons on it, will you? And because it will help modulate your blood sugar. What's the problem if you have too much blood sugar besides diabetes? Fat. fat, yes, you know, because it converts to fat, right? Right. But the bigger problem, it feeds cancer. So how does it feed cancer cells? See, for you, it's very relevant. This is very relevant here, cancer. So uh, sugar can feed the cancer cells, but it does it in a very interesting way. 
it, so the sugar increases something called insulin growth factor, right, IGF-1 factor. So insulin growth factor is what really fuels the growth and, and, you know, of these tumor cells. So that's why you need to really keep your blood sugar even and you don't want to spike it, right? Even does it. So cinnamon is fantastic, okay? So all right, parsley. <coughs> so, um, well, I, I'm, I'm not offering the price. <laughs> just, just yet. I only have two things left, so I have to pace myself. I can see the competitive juice flowing here. This is good. All right. Yes, you had a question back there. I have a question about the cinnamon. Is there something that is, I'm allergic, I'm highly allergic to cinnamon. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> that was too bad. I am too. Is there something? Um, something else in place of cinnamon? Oh, well, well of course. Onions, scallions, mm -hmm. you know, so do you like onions? Yeah, onions. Onions are charlots. I mean, these things all do very similar things, you know. And uh, yes? Is fennel related? How does fennel work? The fennel also, fennel is a digestive, really helps with digestion and so forth. Uh, but cinnamon is one of these spices that have been discovered to be really profoundly impact. So like, it's, it's, it's recommended for people who have insulin resistance, right, pre-diabetes, and uh, diabetic conditions as well. So it really helps. So parsley, I'm going to throw in here cilantro mm -hmm. as well, right? Yeah. Now, how many people do not like cilantro? Come on, it's okay to admit it. It tastes like soap, I know, I know. You like it? I love it too. My wife hates cilantro. She's like, get that thing off my taco, whatever it is. And, and you know, so the, the, the thing about parsley and cilantro is they, they have profound properties in detoxification. Detoxification. This is amazing, right? Because the reality is that a newborn baby, <clears throat> according to the Environment Working Group and the Columbia Center for Children's Environmental Health, a newborn baby in their core blood, it's been found on average of 260 chemicals. So a baby comes in into this world and they already have 260 known toxins in their bloodstream. Okay? It comes from the mom, of course, right? And where does the mom get it? Well, just wherever we are, right? And that's unfortunate because some of these include flame retardants, which kind of acts like estrogen, by the way. And in fact, polar bear in the Arctic are becoming infertile because of the high flame retardants in their bloodstream. Where are they getting it? Thanks to California. California is one of several states that mandate flame retardants in your pajamas and your mattress. Mattress. So here you are, lying there eight hours a night, inhaling flame retardants. Californians have very, I mean, all of us have very high levels of flame retardants in our bloodstream because of that. So you know what I say to that? Well, I only sleep on uh, organic mattress with wool fill so that there's enough spray because wool is a natural flame retardant. So is latex, you know, they have natural latex uh, mattress so forth. I just don't want this chemical in my body, right? But what if you have it in your body? You ask, well, what do I do? Well, detoxify. Eat vegetables like parsley and cilantro. In fact, uh, cilantro has been shown to chelate heavy metals like lead and mercury. So you can actually pull out heavy metals. This is why it tastes like soap. Because it is like soap. It's scrubbing your cells. Uh, what kind of quantities, you know? You just throw cilantro on everything you eat, and that's what I do. And then I put parsley and cilantro through a juicer when I make my vegetable juice. Talking like a condiment, little sprinkler, or are you talking like you need to take a pound and a half? And I, I do pound and a half and put it through a juicer. I do. I, I do do that, and I put it in my vegetable broth. We make this detox vegetable broth for our detox retreats, and it's full of cilantro and parsley. 
Monitor. Well, I mean, a, a, yes. A bunch. Just a bunch is fine, yeah. And uh, organic, of course, yes. Anyway, um, another benefit uh, that parsley cilantro has is that uh, it kills uh, salmonella. So you ever wonder, you know, you go to uh, Mexico and the, you know, the restaurant, they offer you this ceviche of, you know, beautiful seafood and all that. It's cooked in lime. And you go, well, should I eat it? Would I, you know, get the Montezuma's revenge? Afterwards, you kind of debate yourself and, you know, as long as it's got cilantro on it, you can eat it because it goes salmonella. So anyway, that's just a little perk for you. Okay, next, <coughs> ginger. Ah, yes, ginger. The, you're addicted to ginger, yeah. Uh, this one's too easy for you. I'm not going to give it to you. So which, which, what property does ginger have? Digestion. Digestion. See, it's too easy. I, I, I need to find something a little more challenging you guys. Well, ginger is great for, you know, you've all gone through the nausea. It's a horrible feeling. And so you can get ginger juice. You make a juice, right, in a garlic press. And you just take a few drops of that, or you can you can uh, buy it in a health food store. We also have a little ginger extract you can get, or capsules, or just you know make a ginger tea. It's so effective. I have to I have to admit something um, to you. Okay, <clears throat> I normally don't disclose this, and I'm sorry. Well, it's on tape. Gee, I better not disclose it. Uh, but um, it was in my twenties. Um, I, I used to travel to China all the time. This was when I was sourcing all the herbs from the farmers. And these farmers were just so hospitable. And they would invite me to you know, a banquet. They spent like their entire two month salary on, on the banquet, which I felt horrible. But then they, they bring out this uh, Mao Tai, which is, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's something like 40% alcohol. I mean, 40%. It's, it's fire water. And then they plunk it on the table. And this is your honored guest. You know, I'm the honored guest. And, uh, I, and I have to drink. And so they pour me this glass. And I have to gun bay, you know, with them so bottoms up. So here I was. Um, so I would drink one. And then I would take a sip of ginger tea. And I would drink again. I would do ginger tea. I'd do this all night, right? And pretty much at the end of the night, every one of my hosts were falling over. And I was the only one that was still, I, I was still standing. Um, and next day, they all had hangovers, and I didn't. I mean, this is a very powerful little uh, herb spice that you can use. But besides that, it all helps settle the stomach if you have uh, bloating and gas and so forth. So, <clears throat> Oh yes, of course. When you uh, you know it helps you uh, open up your sinuses and you know for common cold, so it's good. All right, rosemary. All right, so yeah, I'm gonna offer up this one here. Uh, this is how many people have done qigong? Tai Chi or qigong? Oh great! Oh so see, I'm I'm preaching to the choir here. So uh, this is self healing qigong. There's five exercises in here, one for each organ system. So let's say, for example, if you felt your liver needed a little extra toning, well, you can self-regulate, or your lungs, or your kidneys, so forth, okay? So there's a DVD. So what property out of the 10 I went through? Mood. Mood. Circulation. Skin. Skin. Brain. Brain. Someone who said brain. All right, so congrats, you win, all right. For the brain, so rosemary, right? So, you ever, do you ever, um, do you ever kind of uh, sniff rosemary? Just break it off the uh, branch, right? It really kind of gives you a little, little zing, right? I mean, it, it sharpens, just even the aroma of rosemary can sharpen your cognitive function. Uh, so, it's great for memory and vision and brain and all of that. So, um, so anyway, so what you can do, of course, you, you can uh, make your rosemary dishes. Of course, rosemary oftentimes is is cooked with chicken and other type of things. But you can you can a fish, right? Rosemary, but you can cook it with other things. You know, I, I make a rose uh, rosemary potato, but I like to make a rosemary sweet potato. 
So what I do is I, I make a sweet potato fries, I bake it as opposed to frying it, and just some olive oil and rosemary, and it is absolutely delicious. I can't keep it uh, in the pantry because the kids just, I mean, I come home and I go, well, what happened to the batch I made last night? It's gone. So you can put in salad. I mean, teas, oh, tea. You can, you can make a tea of rosemary and just inhale the aroma. What well, killer science is, but, but it actually has, oh, clears, yes. But, but it, it's also very good for um, brain cognitive function. So here we go. <coughs> rosemary tea, yeah. Have you had rosemary tea? Oh, it's very fragrant, rosemary tea. <clears throat> mm. All right, so let's talk about basil. And um, what do you think basil would be good for? I, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving the, uh, the, you know, one book for the very important property, so, yes. So, basil, well, of course, it, it's good for digestion, absolutely. But, but it, one of the highlights of, of the basil is it's that it's good for your skin. Skin and beauty, right? Skin health. Absolutely. And uh, so, you know, if you have rashes, if you have itching, you have all kinds of things, make a basil tea. You can even crush up the basil, uh, mix it with, you know, dandelion from your yard, make a poultice and put it on. Very soothing. I like to make a poultice with a little avocado, I mean, um, yeah, um, aloe vera and a little avocado oil. And it's, uh, it, it, it's a wonderful uh, topical. Hmm? Skin marks, to me like scar type of thing. Uh, not as good, the, 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 the skin scarring, it, you're better off doing vitamin E oil and things like that. Yeah. But burns, hmm? Oh, uh, vitamin E, vitamin E oil, yeah, E oil, yeah. Yes, exactly. Oh, old, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, rosacea, this is good for rosacea, absolutely. Yes, yes, so basil. You can make your own mask. By the way, if you have never made, made mask before, you know, this is where I think all this tinkering in my father's uh, herb lab, as well as my mother's kitchen, uh, created, I mean, I just like to make stuff all the time and feed it to my kids. Um, you know, sometimes I can't even pronounce what it is I'm making. But so, uh, so you can take basil and fresh basil, preferably, and uh, if you want to make a mask, you know, and um, and and that's all you have to do. You can add other things if you want, you know, fragrance, but just basil and egg white. You know, you, you first you put in the, a food processor, you crush it up, right, and you add some egg white, and you add a little aloe vera gel, and then you make a mask, and you just put it all over your face this kind of green mask. And if you want a little bit more anti-aging lubrication, put some avocado in it. And, uh, and it's just put on your face, leave it on for 15 minutes. Uh, don't go out with it, please. And you can eat it. And yeah, you can eat it afterwards, absolutely. You can have, you know, you can have it for lunch. Um, all right. Um, Okay, so car karma, karma. What is this good for? Quickly. Sex. sex. Oh, who said sex? Oh, yeah. See, I, I, you have to be fast when it comes to sex. Here you go. No, I, I'm sorry. Here you go. Congratulations. Karma. This thing right here is unbelievable. This is like the best kept secret. How many people incorporate karma into their diet? Probably not. Oh, you do. Oh, fantastic. What is it? It, well, it's a, it's a, see, it's a pod, see, right here, these are pods, and um, it, it, it's often found in Indian food, right, cardamom, but it really is Southeast Asian, all over Asia, right, uh, but this is unbelievable, I mean, it, it's, it's, how fast, wow. It's a good question. I haven't, I haven't timed it. But uh, would you email me and let me know? Yeah. So, <laughs> are, you, are you guys married or no? Oh, you don't know? Oh, yeah. Well, he was yeah, friendly group. Friendly group, yes, yes. So, um, yeah, no, it, it, this works really well. Um, so you can, you know, make your 
Uh, let's say your husband, uh, most of you are, are women here, so I'm not like, you know, sort of, I'm, I'm just saying. So you can, I uh, might find a husband. Oh, just invite uh, someone you like over. It doesn't have to be a husband. I mean, who says you have to have a husband to have sex? I mean, that is so old fashioned. Anyway. You don't have to like him. Absolutely, yes. I mean, you know, it, it, it's, 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 the, it's the juice you're after, huh, you know? Uh, anyway, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, so, so we're all turning to red here, so, yeah, cardamom, it's, it's fantastic, and you can make a cardamom, I have a recipe in there, a cardamom chicken, that's what you can make, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can add it to the tea also. Of course you can add it to the tea. No, it's very fragrant. It's, it smells wonderful. We, I have some back there. So, you know, that's the sexual health one. And that's the one that goes so fast. People can't, like, we can't keep in stock. So, um, all right. So now let's back to this. Lavender, right? Lavender. So what do you think lavender is good for? <laughs> Sleep, mood, good mood, right? Yeah. We talked about good mood. And it is wonderful. You have anxiety, take lavender. In fact, you can just put it next to your pillow and smell lavender and your anxiety will decrease. It'll help you sleep, it'll make you happy. Um, I mean, it's just, it's got so many wonderful properties, yes. You can spray it on a pillowcase, aromatherapy, there's all kinds of things you can do with it, right? You can eat the flower, fresh flower, and um, yeah, absolutely, a lot of flowers are edible, by the way, you know? I mean, I have a couple of flower recipes in there as well, and uh, so, yes? It's a good question, uh, if you're allergic to the smell. <laughs> yeah, you, 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 yeah, you might react, but you could, you could try it and see what happens. <laughs> and have some Benadryl handy, please. <laughs> uh, you can fresh, you know, so fresh lavender. And it's used oftentimes as a garnish, but what I do is, you know, I have some recipes in the, in the cookbook and, and includes like uh, zucchini flour. Very similar, right? Zucchini flour. You can put it in a, in a stew, you can do a stir fry, and then you can you know, the key is not to destroy the flour so you don't cook it a long time. Because what happens if you do, it wilts and it changes color. So, and it falls apart. So what you want to do is you want to you just throw it in there like the last minute. Like, cook no more than a minute. Yeah. Can you infuse like milk You can infuse oil. Oil, of, so you can actually make your, own, make your own lavender infused oil. Of course, the way I make it is I put some garlic cloves in there, and it completely defeats the purpose. However, I love garlic, so to me, garlic smells just like lavender. Anyway. Dry herbs versus fresh when you're cooking. Well, when you're, well, so I, I answered a question earlier. Ideally, uh, fresh is always the best. But, you know, if you don't have access to it, the dry is perfectly fine. <coughs> yes. So, uh, anyway. Um, so we're getting hot in here. Let's uh, move on. Yes, one question back there. How long does dry last? Yeah, well, you have to, you know, if it's dry, you want to put it in a, in a tight container, right? So that you, it's the oxidative stress. You know, oxygen will degrade everything eventually, including our body. So that's why we need to really, um, you know, sort of keep it airtight, okay, if you can. Yes? I just wanted to say that cardamom is great I don't use sugar, but it's great in my brownies, cookies, cakes, yeah, chocolate, right, right. chocolate yes. drinks. There you go. Well, yes, yeah, so of course, yeah. The cardamom, you know, it, it sort of has a similar aroma as nutmeg. You know, you all use nutmeg around the holidays. I suggest, well, it is strong, but it's a little spicier. I would suggest you just get some cardamom. But anyway, um, but you know, what we do is, so, so there are spices that have all these multiple properties. So, then, so what I had fun doing was assembling these spices in, into similar properties, into a blend. And because ultimately I'm busy, 
And when I cook, I don't have time to, so what I do is I have my 10 spices where I marinate and then just put it away or I just throw it into the pan when I'm cooking. And that way I'm not like, okay, where, what happened to my oregano or where's my thyme? Where is, you know, I'm looking all over for what I'm, so anyway, so what I want to do now is, you know, we talked a few things that you can do on your own. We talked about therapies you can engage in. If you never had acupuncture, you should definitely look into it. Um, and, it and the exercise. And I want to turn it over to my partner over here, Dr. Young, who's uh, an, an esteemed doctor. She is very popular. And one of the things she also, she has a subspecialty, which is orthopedic, and she does a lot of rehabilitation uh, for her patients as well. So she's going to kind of share with you got a few tips on exercise, okay, because obviously exercise is so important. How many people um, would like to feel younger? <laughs> this guy over here doesn't want to. He doesn't have his hands up, but anyway. Um, he's fine ways. Do you want to feel younger? Huh? you want to feel younger? <laughs> Rosemary is good for your hearing, by the way. <laughs> Sorry, uh, that, that was a bad joke. Huh? So here's what happened, right? So, so for me, having um, mm -hmm. been paralyzed once for a couple of years, I can appreciate what it's like to have ability to walk and so forth. So one of the things that my father made me do, like all the time, which to my mother seemed really cruel, but this is what I do. Okay, so the one leg squat. And so I do this every single day. And believe it or not, studies show that when you work your quads, which she's going to work you today, um, you produce your natural, your own growth hormones. And growth hormone, as we age, it declines. And then, you know, you get the skin wrinkles and muscle mass decrease and so forth. So there are many things you can do. So exercise is by far, in my opinion, one of the most potent anti-aging things you can do for yourself. So how old I am? I'm ageless. So I've always had a special interest in um, fitness and exercise, and I don't really like to say fitness because a lot of times when people say they're fitness, they're thinking, oh, I'm going to go to the gym and work out on the treadmill or go to classes. Um, but I've always had some type of intuition that you know fitness was really important, and it also helped that I was um, I was born uh, with a very muscular body, so I had a lot of awareness of my own body. Um, just because you know being a female and having and being muscular is not necessarily accepted. So I embr embraced my muscularity um, and really just tried to um, see where this intuition came from. So um, when I started acupuncture school, uh, my aunt was actually diagnosed with um, breast cancer. And when she was diagnosed, I was in a point in my schooling where I couldn't really do anything for her. <laughs> I knew information, but I had nothing practical to give to her. And thankfully at that time, you know, I was learning a lot of Tai Chi Qi Gong for the first time in my life. I had, again, always been interested in movement, but had not really experienced Qi Gong. And so when she was going through um, her chemo, I, uh, um, again, fortunately I was in school, so I, I was there on, um, you know, two days out of the week every time that she did chemo. And so, you know, the first, you know, one of the days was always very bad. She couldn't really move much at all. But once the cloud kind of um, opened up, I really tried to encourage her to move her body. Um, just simple movements, um, even just standing more versus laying down and sitting all the time. You know, I just really tried to encourage her um, to move around a little bit more. So in any case, that's kind of, um, you know, my experience in terms of it really helped her um, mentally to, you know, when she was able to get up and move around, I can see her spirits lift and shift with her body movement. And I think a lot of times we often are only measuring our cardiovascular respiratory health, um, you know, with assessments like your blood pressure, you know, your blood work and all of these things. But what about our musculoskeletal health and does that determine, 
you know, where we are, not only physically, mentally, um, our longevity, does it determine our longevity, our mortality? And I really think it does. And last year I was really just blown away because I've been looking for a study to prove this. And last year a study was put out um, by a Brazilian doctor. Um, he did a um, ob observatory type of study over a, over a six year period with um, people ages about 51 to 80. And he basically assessed their ability to go from a sitting position on the floor, well, to stand, go, from, go sit down, go from a sitting position on the floor and stand up and just observe their ability to do that same task. But really the essence of this movement, one, it takes a lot of coordination to do. And I'll, I'll just, um, I'll, I'll talk and, and do it at the same time. But basically, um, it does take a lot of coordination, right? So one hand's moving, I'm talking, you know, my legs are moving. It takes a lot of brain coordination. So not only is it coordinating your body, but essentially you're sharpening your brain. If you're able to learn these movements and do them, and then even do them while talking, essentially your brain is firing much quicker than, you know, I, I would talk this to my mom, and she has the worst memory. She, like, you could tell her something, and she, at this point, has to write it down, and she'll completely forget it again. Um, and, you know, she just, and, and when I was teaching her, I could see that that firing in her brain was very slow, you know, just to do the arm movement, she was just kind of like, I don't even, where is my hand going? And so, but as, you know, she, it got more fluid, I can tell it was also affecting, you know, her, her cognitive ability. So um, let's uh, all stand. Um, and then if you can't see, we can kind of scoot around and, um, you know, move around. This will be nice anyway to get up and stretch, right? <laughs> so um, if I could have Dr. Mal just kind of walk around. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, yeah. He'll, he'll be my assistant. <laughs> um, and uh, basically, we're just going to start with a what we call horse stance. So Dr. Dao, I, I learned, uh, which is Dr. Mao's brother, I learned a lot of Qigong through him. And he loved to torture us as students doing horse stance. So we're going to start with that. And horse stance is basically your feet are shoulder width apart. If you don't know where that is, you do a nice little hop. And basically, where your feet land, is about shoulder width apart. Um, and then all horse stance is, is a little bend in the knee. It's just a slight squat. So we're all just gonna kind of do that. Just a slight bend in the knee and stand right there. Back straight. Really try not to let your, your back round. So you just wanna just sit down partially. So we're gonna just sit in that um, stance just a little bit. Now, if that is too easy for you, you can go a little lower and hold that there. And you're gonna hold that while I continue talking. Um, and so just doing this, engaging your quads, you're activating endorphins, you're activating your circulatory system. So a lot of things that you're activating, you can already start to feel kind of the blood flowing down there. You can relax a little bit, go ahead and stand back up. So just that stance alone, if it starts to get really easy, you just challenge yourself and go a little bit lower. And maybe at one point, you can go about parallel, and or if you want, you can do the toilet seat, you know? And I think this, a lot of times, is why we see a lot of centenarians in rural countries, is because they squat a lot. You know, they're squatting to use the toilet. They squat to clean the vegetables. They squat to wash their clothes. They do a lot of squatting. So I don't think that this is just a coincidence. I think this is one of the keys to their long health. So your leg strength, and think about how much um, your body has to be carried by your leg strength. So the stronger your legs are, the more capable you feel. So let's get back into that horse stance again. So relax arms, let your arms relax down to your side. Perfect. Nice deep breath, inhale. And I know it sounds kind of weird, but try to relax in this position. Even though you feel that there is a little tension in your quads, really try to let the last, the rest of your body just kind of let loose a little bit. And this is kind of our standing posture. If you ever want to do standing meditation, this is kind of the posture that you would take. Um, so with adding to that, let's do arms. So um, in cloud hands, it's this exchange that we call yin and yang. So you're kind of like wax on, wax on. Everyone's seeing Karate Kid, right? So um, we'll start with the right, we'll, le we'll leave the lower body out of it. Let's start with the arms first. 
So you're kind of looking at, you can, some people like to do it this way, it makes it easier. You look at a mirror, and then you drop the mirror and you look at the other mirror. Okay, look at the mirror on your left hand, drop the mirror and start to look at your right hand mirror. Great. Excellent. We'll do that about five more times. And look at the inside of your palm. Let your eyes slightly gaze towards your hand while you're doing this. So have a focus, focus on your hand. Excellent. Okay, and relax your arm down a little bit. So now when you add the legs, you're just gonna kind of, that same focus you have looking at that hand, you're gonna kind of shift your weight to that same side. Then you shift your weight to the other side. Then shift the weight to the side that you're all that you're looking at your hand, the hand that's above. You need to see it this way. Have more room. Yeah, yeah, d definitely. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, perfect. So shifting the legs. Now, if this is very easy for you, I challenge you to squat a little bit more. If you're saying, gosh, this is elementary. I can do this all day long. <laughs> well, then let's make it harder. <laughs> okay. And if you want, if this feels weird, you can do a wider stance. Get some stretch into that leg. So there's a lot of ways that you can take this very simple movement. You do it every day. Change it up. Um, there's so many ways that you can you can move, move, make this movement. So look at the right hand. Right hand up, perfect. And the left hand. I know, right? That's okay. We'll help you find it. So start start with the right hand. Right hand like a mirror and then left hand like a mirror. Right hand like a mirror, and left hand like a mirror. Very good. All right, and relax that down. How is that? Good. Any questions or comments from, from anybody? No. Yeah, so if you, I, you know, if, if this simple movement was really tough for you, I'd say maybe starting with like 20. You know, do about 20, just to kind of get the movement in, but I mean, essentially you can do this for five minutes. You could do it for 10. You could do a standing posture for 30 if you really wanted to. No, so you do want to inhale, like try to pick one arm to inhale with and the other arm to exhale. So at least there's a rhythm. You're connecting your breath to your movement. So you can, and so if you find you're moving too fast, maybe you're breathing too fast. So inhale real slow, and your movement is real slow. Okay. No, no, you're not looking for a fatigue point. Now you could, if you wanted to use this as like a strengthening exercise, then I would say do more of the horse stance positions. Um, do wider and lower. Um, if you really want to feel like you're working your muscle a little bit more. Now this is great to just kind of get your circulation going at the, at the start of your day, to bring your energy back down at the end of your day. So it's really, the use is very um, varied depending on how you do the movement. Obviously the, the more strenuous in terms of muscular, the more you're gonna get that cardiovascular benefit. The slower, more controlled, you're gonna get that more calming effect. Does that make sense? Any any other questions? Any other questions? Yeah? All right. Thank you, Thank you so much, everyone, for participating.